Great. Okay. I'll just um, make this full screen. Um, thanks. Thanks for, for inviting me to this fantastic uh, set of, of, of talks and discussions. Um, so, I, so um, yes, as, as Max said, I'm from the Department of Computer Science um, here, well, here in Oxford, virtually in Oxford. Um, and um, my, my background is actually that um, before coming into computer science in my, in my um, PhD, I came from a philosophy background. So um, when, I, when I moved into computer science, I thought I'd left uh, philosophy behind despite uh, really enjoying it. Uh, I thought I'd left the kind of debates and political philosophy behind, but I found when I was doing my PhD on, uh, on kind of uh, profiling and uses of personal data, I ended up being dragged back into to debates in political philosophy. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the idea of egalitarian justice in the context of machine learning and particularly focusing on how um, egalitarian justice has featured so far in debates about what it means to make a machine learning model fair. Um, and so in this talk, I want to kind of revisit uh, some of the work that's been done in this space to understand whether egalitarianism as a, as a kind of philosophical notion fits within machine learning. Um, and I think we need to consider a few key dimensions um, to, to understand how that, that fit might work. Um, so I'll go through those through, through the course of the talk. Um, so in early work in this space of fair machine learning, um, one, of the, one of the earliest papers in this space um, by Cynthia Dwork and colleagues um, it referenced um, egalitarian political philosophy as a motivation for why it's important to consider fairness in machine learning. And they mentioned in particular uh, John Rawls, um, a, a highly influential political philosopher of, of the 20th century, um, and also John Romer. Um, and despite mentioning these kind of political philosophers in, in their inspirations, um, the early work in, in, in computer science, looking at fair machine learning, tended not to focus uh, in depth on, on political philosophy, but rather um, nodded towards um, a kind of uh, fairly simplistic uh, interpretations of legal uh, definitions around um, direct and indirect discrimination. Um, so focusing on protected characteristics, um, gender, race, religion, and so on and attempting to um, put constraints on machine learning models such that they would um, avoid direct and indirect discrimination. Um, so kind of a very, a very gross generalization of, of some of the, the measures that have been proposed in machine learning to tackle um, fairness issues. So one family of measures focuses on parity of outcomes between groups. So for instance, if you have a machine learning model which is selecting candidates for interview, uh, then if you have half of your candidates that apply are women, then you should have uh, half of the um, interviews that are, that are awarded should be to women. So that would be outcome parity based measures. Um, there are other forms of, of uh, fairness measure which focus on the distribution of errors. So some of them focus on um, the distribution of false positives between groups. So those who are, um, are, who are classified as risky, um, uh, even though they're not, um, or those who are in who are given a loan, um, even though they're actually bad credit risks. Um, so those would be the kind of equalized error rates uh, kinds of fairness. And then there's uh, then there's calibration, which basically says that the uh, the, the 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 riskiness that a, a group is judged to have should reflect the true risk distributions for that group. So you shouldn't be um, over predicting or under predicting um, between different groups. So if you say that um, uh, a man is uh, uh, a certain level of risk, uh, say on a on 10 point scale seven, then the, the, the true rate of the risky event happening for, for men of that risk uh, threshold should be the same as for women with that risk threshold. So these are different um, fairness constraints that have been proposed in the context of machine learning. And these are uh, constraints that are built into classifiers and prediction models um, with the purported aim of serving some kind of egalitarian uh, ideal of fairness. Um, and, and kind of infamously, um, some results have been, uh, some of these different measures have been shown to be incompatible with each other. 
um, and that's due to um, generally to do with differences in the base rates of uh, between different groups. So uh, differences in either in the base rates of what you're trying to predict, so loan default, for instance, or in differences in the base rates of the things that help you predict what it is that you're interested in. Um, and so these are these are some of the impossibility uh, measures which have been much um, much discussed. Um, now, um, back in 2017, I uh, this is when I sort of I, I, I um, found myself being dragged back into these these philosophical debates that I thought I'd left behind, but but realised they're actually very uh, useful for for understanding how we deal with fairness in machine learning. Um, so. Notions of egalitarian justice within political philosophy are quite internally diverse. So philosophers don't agree on, on what they think uh, egalitarian justice should consist of in, in, in many ways. Um, and, but, but I think that they, they can certainly offer a guide to some of the dimensions that we're navigating in the space of, of um, machine learning. Um, and in that paper um, that was published in 2018, I tried to um, articulate some of the key dimensions um, of, of disagreement within uh, egalitarian uh, justice. So one of those is, is what's called the equality of what debate. So the idea here is um, there are um, there, 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 there's, there are um, egalitarian principles and they say that, that things should be equal, but, but we need to kind of specify what it is ultimately that we want to make equal. Is it that we want to make resources equal between people? That would be a kind of Rawlsian um, currency of justice. Is it that we want to make welfare equal? Is it that we want to make uh, sure that people have equal capabilities to pursue um, things that they, that they want to pursue? So these are, these are differences in the equality of what debate, which I think could have a bearing on, on, on fair machine learning. There's also debates about the role of choice and luck. So um typically uh th th there's a there's a dominant kind of um a fairly a fairly popular form of egalitarianism called um luck egalitarianism and so the luck egalitarians believe that um people that inequalities are unjust unless they're the result of choices that people have made um so if you choose to um you know spend all your money uh, fritter it away um uh, in in las vegas that's your that's kind of something you have to live with because you uh, uh, because you chose uh, to, to, to put yourself in a disadvantage. Um, there may have been luck involved, but it was luck that you chose to subject yourself to. Um, so the luck egalitarians want to compensate, uh, want to use um, egalitarian justice to compensate certain types of inequalities, but not all of them. Um, and they disagree on, on you know, when we should um, hold people responsible for inequalities or not. So um, even in some cases, um, in response to critics like uh, Elizabeth Anderson, um, luck egalitarians have said, well, maybe certain choices we shouldn't uh, allow to justify inequality. So if you choose to forego um, a well-paid, a better paid uh, job in order to um, take care of a dependent person um, that's not a choice that that uh, a luck egalitarian should treat in the same way that uh, that uh, somebody else's choice to, to choose a less well-paid job might be um, so certain choices actually redistribute um, redistribute inequalities or redistribute harms from other people so people who make choices to do that shouldn't be um, shouldn't be effectively punished for, for doing so and so um, we would have differences there um, when it comes to uh, which choices we're going to hold people responsible for. Um, and um, finally, there's this distinction between deontic and telic justice. So the idea here is that um, the, the telic uh, folks believe that inequality is in and of itself bad. Um, so if you imagine two completely disconnected communities who've never um, met each other, one's richer than the other, the telic justice uh, side would say that's that's uh, that's unjust that there's a difference there, whereas the deontic side would say it's only unjust if the two communities are in some way uh, bound up in some kind of relationship with each other. Now that could be a kind of global trade relationship, which could be unjust, which would ground um, uh, egalitarian measures to correct that inequality. Um, so that would be one example where the the the, uh, the 
the deontic side would 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 justify um, redistribution of some form. Um, so the idea here is that we can use these kinds of distinctions to il illuminate some of the debates that are happening in, in fair machine learning. So recall that the incompatibility um, that I mentioned earlier. So there we have a situation where um, if the base rates are different between two groups, so let's say if men are more likely to commit a violent offence, the base rates are different. Um, so uh, we can't satisfy uh, equality of outcome. We can't satisfy um, uh, outcome parity um, without violating um, error parity in some way, because we're going to have to bias our classifier accordingly. Um, but the, the deontic approach, which suggests that we should focus on the historic reasons for unequal base rates. Um, so if there's historic uh, reasons behind unequal base rates in, say, um, criminal recidivism, let's say in, in the US context, um, on racial grounds, then um, we should bear that in mind when we're using uh, distributions between populations as a justification for um, differential treatment. So if it turns out that the reason for uh, the higher rates of recidivism among African Americans is due to historic injustices, um, then we can't use that fact as a, as a basis for justifying um, the choice of a certain uh, fairness measure over another. Um, so we can understand, uh, uh, we can appeal to the social processes which cause the statistical regularities, differences in base rates to obtain in the first place um, to question the, the fairness of, of a system. Um, and what I didn't do there was in, in that paper was kind of map specifically to um, specific measures, but, um, but, but I think other, other people have done that in a more explicit way um, since since then, um, so we return to these um, these uh, uh, fairness measures. So outcome parity, you you could you could justify outcome parity on the basis that even if there are differences in base rates between groups, um, if we assume that those base rates are um, on the let's say on the luck egalitarian account, differences in base rates are not due to choices that we would uh, want to hold people responsible for. Um, then we should basically ignore those base rates. And so one thing we could do potentially is use outcome parity as a, as a fairness measure, um, because we can't trust the base rates as a, as a kind of uh, marker for deserved outcomes. Um, whereas equalized error rates or calibration would both suffer from that, that issue. So as I said, others have kind of have kind of um, taken the, some of these ideas um, to much more uh, applied them much more rigorously um, and explicitly to different fairness measures. Um, so Haidari and colleagues in 2019 um, defined a kind of uh, luck egalitarian equality of opportunity measure for for fair machine learning. Um, you can think about counterfactual measures as a kind of limited form of luck egalitarianism. In that they, what the counterfactual measures of fairness do is is take, uh, is, is attempt to uh, reconstruct a causal graph um, by um, by considering uh, not just the effect of a protected characteristic on an outcome, but on all of the things that might be causally downstream of the protected characteristic. And so, if we think about luck egalitarianism in this context as as, as specifying that um, the protected characteristic that you have isn't something that you uh, chose to have. Uh, it's not something that we would want to hold people responsible for if it results in inequalities. Um, so that would be a kind of limited luck egalitarianism. Um, hopefully you, you've all read the paper from, from uh, Casey and Abebe in 2021, which looks at the causal impact of algorithms on inequality. I think this is a it, um, kind of uh, takes a step further by Kind of not focusing on uh, on the sort of uh, discrimination or derived concerns, but more explicitly focusing on on economic inequality. Um, there's also a paper from 2016, which is which was only just um, published, but was available since 2016, which um, which focuses on the fact that if we want to justify a certain choice of fairness measure, we need to make some assumptions about worldviews. And so on one worldview assumption, if we see differences in base rates between two groups, um, we can either assume that those differences are due to um, you know, choices uh, or um, deserved differences between groups, 
um, or we can assume that they are due to either measurement bias in the way that the data is collected or some sort of other structural bias in the world that has caused those differences and therefore wouldn't justify um, going for like a calibration measure or an error quality measure. Um, and then just, the, just the one other example, um, Chelsea Barabas and, and colleagues in 2018 um, advocated thinking about interventions, um, using machine learning to intervene in order to prevent the compounding of what I would characterize as bad luck. So you can think of this in a, in a kind of egalitarian sense as, as using ML to predict where the uh, unjust uh, chips are going to fall as a result of, of um, existing inequalities, how those inequalities are going to be compounded. Um, and so actually using ML to uh, target uh, redistribution or compensation or, or other forms of egalitarian measures. Okay, so this, this um, seems to be uh, drawing us towards a notion that we, we, in some cases, we can and should apply notions of egalitarian justice to machine learning models. Um, and the question is, how, how do we do that? The dominant approach so far has been to try to apply uh, these kinds of fairness principles um, to models themselves by building them into constraints that we apply to classifiers. Um, and I think that this is an interesting, uh, but potentially uh, difficult to grapple with um, proposal. Um, and so I think in order to kind of elucidate, elucidate how that should work, if, it, if indeed it's something that we do want to do, we need to consider, we need to kind of go back to those debates within egalitarianism and consider a few different dimensions, which I'm going to present to you today. And I'm not, I'm not really going to come down very firmly on any side here, but um, you'll probably you probably get a sense of, of, of where I fall on some of these things. But the idea is to kind of open the, the discussion up to these different um, these different dimensions of egalitarianism. So first of all, um, the object of justice. So I spoke about this before when I was talking about the equality of what debate. So the equality of what debate concerns what kinds of things we're concerned about making equal. Um, so we might be thinking about loans, we might be thinking about jobs, we might be thinking about how many years somebody spends incarcerated, we might be thinking about educational opportunities. Um, but whatever the benefits or burdens that the ML model is involved in distributing, um, we care about that distribution ultimately because it affects some kind of some more fundamental kind of inequality. Um, so philosophers like to argue about what that one true uh, currency of egalitarianism should be. Um, so typically in economics, you might measure wealth or income, but philosophers tend to go a little bit more abstract and think about things like resources. So that would be um, uh, John Rawls, uh, Dworkin. They might think about uh, equality of welfare. That's G.A. Cohen's view. They might think about equality of capabilities. That's Amartya Sen's view. Um, and all of these are considered allocative or distributional varieties of egalitarian justice. So this is in the sense that they are concerned with what the right distribution of some kind of good is. Um, and so by implication, we can further justice by changing the mechanisms by which distribution of these goods happens uh, to ensure a kind of inequality of some sort. Um, and if we're concerned about welfare, then we may want to change our laws, our policies, taxation, et cetera, to achieve a more equal distribution of welfare. If we're concerned about capabilities, then we might want to look into measuring what people are capable of in practice and how different mechanisms change what they're capable of doing. Um, some reject the distributive paradigm. So some focus instead on uh, relational inequalities. So they focus on having, um, say, equal political and democratic status between citizens. That's Elizabeth Anderson's view. Um, so the question is, how do ML systems in actual deployment rate to, relate to these different objects of justice? And the task here would be to map out how the allocation of loans, jobs, incarceration, educational opportunities, etc., that models relate to, uh, how, those, how those things relate to the kinds of inequalities that we care about. And I think here, probably a lot of the philosophical debates about the currency of justice might not be that enlightening. Um, they might be a bit pernickety and not make that much difference in practice. Does it really make a difference whether you believe that resources or welfare are the correct 
currency of egalitarian justice if what you're concerned about is the impact of ML on jobs or education opportunities or loans, etc. We can probably make an equivalent case either way, so that whichever type of egalitarian you are, you'll, you'll be you'll, you'll agree. Um, but that said, I do think there are some um, aspects of these debates that have lessons for how we assess justice of ML models on the ground. So first of all, I think it's important to um, recognize that um, there's, a, there's a problem with the way that some approaches to fair ML uh, seem to suggest or, or could be interpreted as suggesting that the currency of justice that we need to be concerned about equally distributing is something like predictive accuracy or error. Um, so rather than thinking about how a model distributes benefits or burdens per se, it seems like in some of these contexts that justice in machine learning consists of ensuring an equal distribution of errors between different social groups, for instance. Um, and I think that th there are certainly interesting questions about how differential accuracy or error rates relate to unjust inequalities. It doesn't make much sense to me to think about accuracy as a kind of uh, good that can be distributed fairly or unfairly between groups. Um, first of all, it's not the kind of thing that we can easily conceive of as accruing to individuals. It's a property of the relationship between a model and a population on whom um, it's, uh, it's, it's deployed. Secondly, the principles of justice that are typically proposed don't really make sense in the context of distributing accuracy. So rules, um, what rules calls his maximin principle, uh, this roughly says that it's okay to tolerate inequalities um, so long as they benefit the worst off. Um, I happen not to agree with that on, on, on rules on, on maximin, but if you do agree with rules on the maximin principle as a principle of justice generally, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to agree with the application of maximin straightforwardly into the distribution of accuracy in a machine learning model. That doesn't, that doesn't necessarily apply because the, the worst off group in terms of accuracy might be a better off group when we consider harms and benefits uh, resulting from the model uh, more generally. So I think approaches to fair ML which try to apply principles of justice to the distribution of accuracy within a model can be criticized um, from that perspective. Also from the perspective of someone who doesn't believe in distribution uh, as, the, as the right framing for egalitarianism. So someone like Elizabeth Anderson who, who disagrees with the distributed paradigm and, and goes for a more relational one would probably not, uh, not, uh, uh, not go for a kind of uh, accuracy distribution view of fair ML. Um, second, while some of the debates in this space are very abstract and say little about how particular uh, institutions or policies or political forms need to change to bring about justice, um, some of those who've proposed answers to the equality of what debate have specified what, uh, what that means for action in the real world. So I'm thinking here particularly of Amartya Sen's capabilities approach. This doesn't just answer what should we care about being equal, but it actually is, is coupled with a methodology for measuring capabilities um, and contextualizing our analysis within the context of a particular project. So um, this is particularly in the context of economic development that has been, has been developed. Um, and if you're interested in this question, I think um, I can recommend reading Alan Lundgaard's master's thesis on this, uh, which came out last year or a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, I recommend reading that. Um, third, as I mentioned earlier, some egalitarian uh, theorists focus on the relational approach. Um, and so, um, yeah, as I said, the, the, the relational approach would not make much of thinking about distribution of accuracy, but it also um, doesn't make sense if you think about the, um, even if your ML model is perfectly maximizing some egalitarian distribution of resources, say, it might still be unjust if it means that different actors, say corporations and citizens, um, stand in unequal relations to each other. Um, and I think this point is very well made in Max and Lydiet's paper um, in relation to the question of uh, who has the power to decide on the objective function of a model. Um, so moving on to the site of justice. Um, so this is the second dimension of the debate within egalitarianism that I think is important to address uh, if we want to apply egalitarian justice to ML. Um, so the site of justice, um, some people talk about the, the site as the subject of justice, um, but I don't think it's so helpful to think of it in those terms. Um, so, so the site of justice is the, is the kind of the question of where does justice apply? What's the location where the justice is supposed to happen? 
uh, and what kinds of relationships give rise to demands for justice. Um, and so, um, so as I said, the, the, this is sometimes conflated with the subject of justice, and it makes sense to do that if you think that the site of justice is the state. So if you think that the primary site of justice is um, the, the state which is um, setting up the basic structure of society, so the constitution, um, the, the laws, the, the institutions that um, determine sort of major economic um, policies and outcomes, um, these are what rules call the basic structure. And so it makes sense to, if you think about the state as the site of justice, it's probably also the subject of justice, the place that the, 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 the subject who does, who, who kind of creates justice. Um, but you can tear those, those things apart as well. Um, there's, there's debate within egalitarianism about the scope of the site of justice. Um, so to give you some examples, um, so there's John Rawls who thought that we should think about the basic structure, uh, constitution, economic and legal systems and so on. Um, there are also views such as uh, G.A. Cohen's view that justice applies not just to the basic structure, but also to relationships between people. So he likened society to a camping trip where justice applies not only uh, at, the, at the kind of state level, but between everyone taking part in the camping trip. Um, so we have to um, apply justice when we're treating each other as well as apply justice when we're designing society. Um, cosmopolitans think that justice applies at a global level. Um, so they think that um, you know, uh, if two, two countries are, are un unequal, um, and that's due to historical or modern day colonialism, global capitalism, then that may ground uh, demands for justice between them. Um, so um, those are some of the sort of uh, the, the different approaches to the site of justice. Now, um, if we want to um, apply uh, principles of justice to ML systems, we need to articulate what role those systems play in the site of justice. So under, under a kind of Rawlsian basic structure approach, we need to understand how ML systems play a part in the basic structure. Under a more expansive account of the site of justice, um, such as Cohen's view, we need to also um, take into account um, interpersonal aspects. Or if we're taking a cosmopolitan view, we need to take into account um, you know, the impact of ML systems globally, possibly also on future generations. So if we're thinking about environmental impacts of ML, we might need to consider future generations in that context. Um, and so I think it's true that ML systems typically are part of a societal structure and as such uh, can be uh, used to increase or decrease inequality. So we can potentially point, it's a, that we can use ML systems in deployment as a point to insert you know, forms of egalitarianism. It's a lever that we could potentially use to achieve some egalitarian aims. Um, but I think that we should exercise caution about how we how we approach that. Um, and so I think there are some limitations. So I think um, I'll offer three considerations about, about whether and how ML systems could be used as a means of pursuing egalitarian aims. Um, so um, well, it's, it's not really three, it's more just one, it's more just one, but expressed in different ways. So so I think there's a there's a fallacy of composition if we think about um, the, the level at which um, egalitarianism is typically considered is about um, inequalities between people's lives considered overall. So think of it like a picnic. If, I, if, if we go to a picnic and I eat more than my fair share of the pie, that might not be a problem if you've already had your, more than your fair, fair share of the cheese. So if I've already eaten more of the pie, that's bad if then I insist that we have an equal share of the cheese. But if you've already eaten more of the cheese than, than would be fair, then maybe it balances out at the global level of the picnic. Um, so the same logic could be applied to the deployment of ML systems. So like the cheese plate, um, models are implicated in particular microsites of distribution. So we're thinking about the, 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 the distribution of jobs in a particular employer, the distribution of loans by a, a lender, educational opportunities by a university or a school. So how are these things distributed at particular levels? Um, that certainly um, is an important determinant of how well your life goes overall, but it doesn't mean that it's always gonna make sense to try and equalize outcomes at the, each micro site of a decision-making context. 
In fact, doing so could have actually regressive consequences for inequality if those who are already in an unequal position, uh, for, for those who are already in an unequal position. So if I've already eaten more than my half of the cheese, it's not fair for me to insist that we share the pie equally. Um, this would be a kind of fallacy of composition because I'm assuming that because one part of the system is fair, the whole system is fair. Um, so if we take, uh, if we, if we, we think about a background assumption um, that justice is applied to at the state level or at the global justice level, um, then uh, if we try to apply these same egalitarian principles at particular decision-making contexts, uh, we're going to go wrong. Um, it's possible that different principles of distribution also might be appropriate at different levels and different vertical silos. So maybe at the level of considering global taxation policies where the site of justice is nation states, uh, we should focus on equalizing wealth. Maybe at the level of the state, we consider welfare. Maybe at the level of particular ML algorithms, um, we're focusing on improving capabilities of the least well-off. Um, so that's just a random sort of example, but um, we, could, we could take different positions on uh, the principles of justice that should apply and the currency of justice that should apply at different sites of justice. Um, so, um, we might also consider how things add up or don't add up across different verticals. Um, so for instance, if there are health inequalities that spill over into um, inequalities in pay in the labor market or vice versa, we might think about how these things balance out. So, um, you know, men may pay higher insurance premiums, but that's against, uh, for, for, for cars, uh, for, for car insurance, but that's against a background of a gender pay gap, right? So maybe, Ideally, in an ideal world, we seek to eliminate both the uh, differences in insurance premiums um, and the gender pay gap. Um, but in the real world, I think you know, it's clear that one of those is, is a much bigger problem than the other. Um, and so it'd be a mistake to insist on, on equality in those few spheres where normally privileged groups are actually um, un unusually disadvantaged. It should be more of a priority to address, say, the gender pay gap than it is to address car insurance premiums being higher for men. Um, and I, th I think it's ironic that, um, that one of the few examples where men are discriminated against is, is, is one of the ones that, the, that was um, tackled by um, European Court of Justice um, in the test Ashat's case. Um, so I think you know, we, we, we don't wanna be uh, sort of uh, assuming that we should be trying to always, uh, at least as a matter of priorities, we should be focusing on those inequalities which are uh, are kind of most pressing. Um, I think this, this question about different micro sites of justice not adding up at a macro level is, is probably a problem for the distributive approach and maybe also a problem to a lesser extent for the relational approach. Um, I think the relational approach is perhaps slightly better off because um, the advocate of a relational approach might be able to address this more easily because um, sadly it's very rare that the use of machine learning systems will actually distribute power in a way that reduces overall inequalities in power between people. So we can imagine ML systems that might do that. Um, you know, predictive policing for corporate crime, which might reduce the power of global finance, maybe. But by and large, that's not the kind of, of ML systems that we see in practice. So worth also considering fallacies of composition at a more fine-grained level. Um, so ML models are part of broader socio-technical processes, and so the application of a human decision maker might also balance things out at another level. Um, moving on, um, responsibility for justice. So um, I said before that some people blend together the site of justice with responsibility for ensuring justice, uh, and that makes sense if it's the state. The state is both the site and the, re uh, the responsible party for ensuring justice. Um, but we can think about um, other approaches as well. So um, if you take GN's, GA Cohen's criticism of rules, um, we might think that individuals have, uh, have obligations to, um, to do uh, good things for you know, redistribution of wealth or, or other things. Um, part of the reason why the question of responsibility is fraught is that we often consider justice and explain injustice at different levels of explanation. Um, so um, sometimes we might think of, um, sorry, I'm just gonna check, how much time do I have? Is it 50 minutes or 40 minutes? Yeah, 50 minutes left. 50, 
Sorry, I guess sorry, so you have five minutes for the talk and then we'll have 10 minutes of discussion, right? Five more minutes. Okay, cool. Good, good. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, part of the reason why responsibility is difficult is that um, we often want to, um, it, a particularly attractive view of injustice is a sort of structural approach to injustice. So we sometimes might think about justice on an individual level, so the choices that an individual has made, um, but typically it, it, it uh, makes more sense to think about the structural conditions that, that surround an individual's life, whether they be the structural conditions that determine um, outcomes on their own or that, that actually influence the choices that people have or make. Um, and so if we're thinking in those terms, um, it makes sense to think in structural terms. So to use uh, Sally Haslanger's um, social structural ex explanations, where we, we, we look at the structures that, that, for instance, mean that women are positioned in a self-perpetuating economic structure that systematically disadvantages them. So on that approach, um, it becomes uh, more difficult to think about responsibility for justice um, because um, there's no one actor that can that can make a difference. Um, so Iris Marion Young has given some thought to this topic. So she argues that for what she calls the social connections model. Um, so this is the idea that um, everybody has a part to play in um, in, in tackling structural injustice. Um, and so this is not to, to take um, states off the hook for their responsibilities or corporations off the hook for their responsibilities. But it's to acknowledge that we're all uh, kind of that we're all locked into various systems that constrain the the, the effects that we can have. Um, Robin Jeng has a nice um, way of explaining this. She says oppressive structures are perpetuated by the ongoing behaviors of all participants, albeit in different ways. They cannot be transformed by the act of one individual or collective agent, no matter how powerful. Um, so Jeng provides what I find to be a useful revision to Young's theory. So she says that we're all responsible for structural injustice through and in virtue of our social roles. So the roles, roles are the site where structure meets agency. So the roles that you have in your life uh, will determine what agency you have to change the system that you're in. So in the context of ML, I think this means that um, if we take the structural view, we have to appreciate that uh, insofar as the structures that, that we're operating in are unjust, no one actor is capable of changing them. Um, and so we have roles to play in structural change, um, and that has to be part of a larger effort. So no one can be sort of held res solely responsible. Um, I think uh, an example of an individual, individuals using their social roles as part of an effort to affect broader structural change in the in the ML AI space would be um, the Google researchers Tim Gebru and, and Margaret Mitchell, who internally tried to push for uh, to hold powerful actors to account, um, but were fired as a result of that. So the idea is not to let governments and corporations off the hook, but to acknowledge that we all have roles to play. Um, and so workers resisting unjust practices can hold corporations to account just as, um, as, as citizens in the ballot box and so on. Um, finally, um, focusing on what we might think of as, I'm um, oh, sorry, I've skipped ahead there. So I'm gonna skip this one, but, but basically the idea is um, ideal versus non-ideal theory. Most egalitarians thinking uh, in this sort of Rawlsian tradition think about uh, what would the ideal society look like and how what principles would govern that. Um, Non-ideal theory basically says that's not a useful way to get us to, to, to help us figure out what to do about current injustice. And so if we're trying to characterize injustice, maybe ideal theory might be useful. But if we're actually trying to address it, then we need non-ideal theory. Finally, um, thinking about uh, what uh, Mackenzie Watt calls um, the game space of, of, um, of society. So um, Eric Olin Wright, the, the late um, sociologist, had this idea of, of, of um, different levels at which um, political conflict can happen. So um, he talks about um, the, uh, the, the situational level so this is about moves within a game. So in this context, you might think about uh, interest group politics, about different policies like um, taxation. Should tax, taxes be a little bit more progressive or aggressive? Should students be charged more or less tuition fees for universities and so on? And these are kind of what, what Wright calls moves within a game. Um, second, we have the institutional level. So at this level, we accept that we are playing that we accept the game that we're playing, 
but we don't necessarily accept the rules that we're playing in. So we can redesign institutions um, in quite substantial ways to give different players within the game more or less advantage to change the moves that are available to them. Um, and third, we have the systemic level. So this is this is where we question the very game that we're playing. So, so from, from a Marxist perspective, um, we might question the game of capitalism, for instance. Um, and the conflicts here are between um, uh, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary forces. So how does all this relate to ML? Well, I think um, probably in most cases in the context of fair machine learning, we're talking about situational level uh, conflicts. So moves within the game, given that the rules are the way they are, we wanna use the law, for instance, whether that's equality law or data protection law to ensure that existing rules of say equality are applied to algorithms. Um, I've personally, so a lot of the work I've done has been focused at this level. Um, and I think there is value in that. Um, but, um, but, uh, but you know, there are also limitations. Um, another level is we could think about applying norms of egalitarian justice to achieve institutional level change. So maybe we're thinking about new laws which would change the social compact around the use of data. Maybe we're thinking about facial recognition bans, for instance. And then finally, in other cases, we might be thinking about um, bringing about egalitarian justice at a systemic level. Um, and I think these are quite rare. We don't really um, see much of this. And I think, um, you know, to some extent, machine learning is, is almost perhaps um, the wrong tool to be to be thinking about if we're if we're trying to achieve system level changes rather than you know so rather than tinkering with objective functions, we we we'd be more thinking about more fundamentally resisting um, the structures that algorithms are embedded in. Um, and I think some some proposals will cut across these different levels. Um, so um, you know, there's this idea of non-reformist reforms, which um, Ben Green talks about in, in his paper on data science as political action. Um, so some some proposals will will bleed across these different um, these different levels. But I think it's useful to think to keep them in mind when we're talking about uh, how we want to apply egalitarian norms to machine learning systems. Um, so I will I will finish up there um, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, it was great. I think we have one question from an audience member. Hi, um, I was wondering what your objection is to Rawls's uh, maximum principle that you, you mentioned that you were talking about. Um, I think the, you call it what? I think the internet came up. I didn't catch the end there, but I, 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 I got the question, what, what do I, why do I object to Rawls's maximum principle? Um, so, so I think I, I think I disagree with it at a kind of basic political level, um, but I think for basically because um, I don't think it's demanding enough. So I think it's um, having having a system which which um, has greater inequality but leaves the worst off better off than they otherwise would have been. Um, I think it from a kind of relational perspective it puts the worst off still in unequal relations of power. Um, to to other um, groups in society, so that would be my objection to that. But but even if you buy that maximum principle, I think it doesn't make much sense in the context of ML because um, the thing that's being distributed a might not add up at the macro level as a result of the ML system, and b um, if you think of it in terms of distributing um, accuracy, I don't think accuracy is the kind of primary good that rules would even want to 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 talk about when he's thinking about maximum. Well, do you want to go next? Yeah, I just I had a quick question about I feel like very much as a student in this, so this feels like the kind of question a student would ask. But it's in in economics we'd have this this. I'm trying to think about in the language of how you've been describing this, how one should think about kind of the feasibility constraint of you know, were talking about these things and there's the moral aspect where I think of almost as normative, and a lot of times and I'll talk about this later today, but I was just trying to think about. How should, what school of thought or how would these different schools of thought think about, you know, what can we practically kind of impose that will not maybe backfire or will potentially like have people act in the appropriate ways that we want them to like feasibly can be sustained when they're competing against other firms, things like that. And I'm just curious, maybe you could speak to like what language it gets used to think about that or how we should think about that morally um, in this framework. You're, you're muted, Ruben. Um, two, two things I'd say about that. So I think 
there's so one of the things that that um, Iris Marion Young talks about in in that the paper on um, the social connections model is that even even global corporations are actually despite being very powerful are also tightly constrained by systems Cap capitalism globally is is uh, expects them to have sweatshops in order to compete against each other um, so so they they recognizing that they are constrained themselves. Um, and there's a difficult balance to be struck between a um, account of responsibility for justice, which is not too demanding, which doesn't sort of require that everybody give up everything they have to um, sort of maniacally pursue ends of justice, but that also isn't isn't under demanding. Um, so I, I think it's a challenge. Um, another way to interpret your so I don't have a really have an answer to that, but but I think there's kind of um, you know that the keeping in mind both of those those things is important um, and focusing on social roles and wh where whatever levers that you do have access to um, that's kind of determines how much responsibility an individual should should have um, and then just on the sort of feasibility of different mechanisms I think that the point I made at the end about these different levels um, so challenging so challenge um, moves within the game challenging the rules of the game and challenging the game itself I like to think of them as like the, the the first one is very feasible but but the effect is less so if we're, if we're moving within the rules of the game we, we might make some small uh, changes for the for the good if we're moving but but they're more likely to be successful if we're moving at the systemic level um much li less likely to be successful but the, the the prize is much bigger if you if you win um so yeah just that's some kind of feasibility So I would have a question about, um, you mentioned earlier on the, the incompatibility results that have kind of received a lot of attention in the fairness literature. And I guess people people stress of how these things are actually contradictory, but I guess my sense is like, if we, if we in particular consider the limit of perfect predictability, they kind of all collapse, right? They all make basically the same assessment and very much in a way that contrasts with all the notions of egalitarian justice that you were discussing. I was wondering how you think about that. Like whether we could maybe emphasize more the commonalities rather than the differences between these notions. Muting myself again. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I guess I basically agree with that. That like, if you if you take it to to the um, you sort of abstract away all the problems by imagining perfect prediction, then what we end up with is yeah, it's something very different to to what the egalitarians would want. And so I, I think that's a good rhetorical way of sort of uh, clearing the decks and then getting people to focus on you know, to what extent are we uh, obscuring the egalitarian demands by um, but by focusing on like the different fairness metrics um, and so yeah I, I quite like that that sort of um, that approach to it um, but yeah, I think ultimately, if 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 you agree, if you if you sort of agree on the on the egalitarian principles, and you agree on the application of them to a particular context, so you agree on which variables, if you're a luck egalitarian, say you agree on which variables are um, kind of freely chosen, and we would want to hold people responsible for them, then I think all of the disagreements about fairness metrics and incompatibilities kind of probably go away, to the, to a large extent. Um, I just wanted to hop in because I was nodding emphatically when you first of all mentioned Tully Haslanger and structural explanations, but now also these answers about these different levels. Um, and I think there, uh, this is this is part of what I'll talk about tomorrow. But one is using these different levels as a way to sort of imagine risks and impacts of sort of like if I'm making this local choice that improves this thing locally, what is this, what are sort of the downstream things just because one part of the system is fair does not mean overall as a system. So one way it's like a way to imagine uh, impacts. Um, uh, but the other is that um, it it also sort of I think points out, I, I think to your point just now to, to Max that um, when we say that, you know, this is fair or egalitarian at this level, we might be imagining a larger sense of justice <laughs> um, or a larger sense of fairness. And so in a way that sort of obscures the larger structural system. So uh, anyways, I'm going to chew on this before tomorrow <laughs> to be ready. Thanks, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs>
but we take the questions on the Q&A. You could unmute them. Um, yeah, so I think there, one of them I can ask without unmuting, which is how do you see the role of law? That's a good question. Um, I think to put it in the context of the final point about levels of uh, levels in the game space, I think um, law is mostly at the situational level. So it's it sets rules of the game and um, you can use those rules to make uh, moves in the game. And I think that's that's super important that we that especially um, in a situation where we have lots of rules and some of them can be used to be to to further ends of egalitarianism um we, we you know we should we should be making use of them i mean my a lot of my work has been in data protection law um and i think data protection law is a kind of um it's a good it, it fits this metaphor of the game space very well because it sets out a set of, of rules but it doesn't um you know there's nowhere in data protection law that says uh, you should maximize uh, equality, right? But those who care about equality um, can use data protection law in various ways um, to push for more equality. So something we've been um, discussing a lot in um, in Jeremiah's reading group on um, algorithms at work is the ways that you could use data protection law to challenge um, unfair working practices. So I'm thinking generally here that, you know, um, empowering workers, generally speaking, will, will address at least some of these um, inequalities that, that we've been talking about. So there, there are ways that data protection law can be used um, at a kind of situational level. I suppose if you were to create a new law, um, that could be, you could see that as, as working at a kind of institutional level. Um, so, um, you know, uh, things like facial recognition bans, for instance, would be a kind of institutional level um, thing, so changing changing the rules of the game or adding new rules to the game. Um, I suppose that the the um, system level uh, strategies are less less focused on law, I suppose, because um, either because you know if you if you're a Marxist, you you may not think mu may not have much to say about laws as they currently are because they reflect you know a, an ideology of capital. Um, but other, I suppose, other systemic changes might involve thinking about about legal changes. But typically, the the if you're changing the entire structure, um, the specific laws that you want to change is kind of is kind of too uh, too minuscule a thing to worry about, or, or to, to to imagine what the rules might be in, under a different system is also kind of too speculative, perhaps. Um, the second question is from. Caitlin, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks very, very much. It, it was uh, illuminating. I, my, I have a, uh, my basic question is, which I think that you've started to tease out um, before I gotten to ask it about why you think um, machine learning is more suited for situational change than institutional change. But I see that that's your point of view, really. Um, because we know that data protection law doesn't help. We work on discrimination and bias and we're beginning to see that there actually needs to be a new set of laws and that we can't kind of use data protection as, as our way in to change the system. So I'm gonna move my question over unless you wanna um, tell me that I don't understand what you've said correctly to your idea of ideal theory versus non-ideal theory. As activists, we work only to address injustice as opposed to characterize it. So could you also just talk about those two theories that would be different? Thanks. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think you understood me rightly, although I would say uh, I'm, I'm generally more optimistic about data protection than being used to, to, in some ways, potentially create institutional changes as well, but, but not on its own. It needs to be coupled with other um, kind of other forces, I suppose. Um, so yeah, you, but you 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 got my position right there um, on on the sort of ideal non ideal distinction. So I think there's a great paper by Sinner Fazlpour and Zach Lipton about this, um, where they they talk about how um, trying to apply ideal theory to ML fairness uh, doesn't work 
and um, because the world isn't ideal. Um, but so the, the idea here is basically that um, if we start with ideal and we try to um, try to use that to, to kind of generate ideas about how to um, address current injustice. Um, let me find my quote on that. Um, yeah, so the, so the idea is that um, there's, a, there's a great quote from Charles Mills on this. So he says, if we start from what is presumably the uncontroversial premise that the ultimate point of ethics is to guide our actions and make ourselves better people and make the world a better place, then the framework above, the ideal framework, will not only be unhelpful, but will in certain respects be deeply antithetical to the proper goal of theoretical ethics as an enterprise. In modeling humans, human capacities, human interaction, human institutions, and human society on ideal as idealized models, in never exploring how deeply different this is from ideal as descriptive models, we're abstracting away from realities crucial to our comprehension of the actual workings of injustice in human interactions and social institutions, and thereby guaranteeing that the ideal as idealized model will never be achieved. Um, so the idea is that, um, I think, is that uh, if we start at the end point that we want to achieve, we don't, we don't get any clues as to how to move from our local, uh, uh, local um, optima to the, to the global optima, to use a kind of ML analogy there. Um, you, you, you don't necessarily make progress by thinking about what the ideal situation should be. Um, so that, that's the idea. And I suppose, yeah, I, 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 I won't be able to kind of give a, a sort of good account of, of how that applies to ML systems in, in the time we've got, but I recommend reading the, the paper by Fazalpour and uh, Lipton um, from a couple of years ago. I think it's called oh. um, Ideal, it's got the word non-ideal and uh, ML in it. <laughs> then maybe I'll call it break now, since we're already running slightly over time. We have the next talk 10 minutes past the hour, but it would be great to maybe continue the discussion at the end of the day if people still have energy then. And otherwise we'll meet in 10 minutes to, for the next talk to ready it. Thank you, Ruben. Thanks.